A billionaire who rubbed shoulders with US Presidents Donald Trump and Bill Clinton has been accused of running a sex trafficking ring involving underage girls. Jeffrey Epstein's prison guard just revealed some of the most shocking information about the prisoner's last moments. From Epstein's extreme mental deterioration to severe insomnia and strange deceptions, this guard spilled the beans on everything. He even admitted to being guilty of negligence in his duties. The DOJ watchdog blames the disgraced financier's suicide in a Manhattan jail on guard negligence and misconduct. The more he speaks, the more the story keeps unfolding, revealing gross negligence, conspiracies and mysteries that will leave you shocked. Tova Noel and Michael Thomas are accused repeatedly of failing to conduct 30-minute inmate checks and of falsifying jail records. Join me as I examine the Epstein suicide case in light of these new revelations made by this previously silenced prison guard. He estimated dozens of victims were as young as 14 years old. It was referred to as a revolving door of young girls. How could you have kept something this massive, this secret for this long? For those who aren't aware, Jeffrey Epstein was a high-profile financier who partied with billionaires, kings, princes, and presidents. But in secret, he ran a side business of sex trafficking underage girls and boys for those same powerful people. After his arrest in 2019, Epstein was charged with sex trafficking and conspiracy and the looming potential of serving over 45 years in prison. Unsurprisingly, Epstein had pleaded not guilty and was waiting for his case to go to trial. But when the overwhelming amount of evidence piled up and a dozen teenage girls made the brave decision of coming forward and testifying against him, Epstein saw another way out. Death. Now, we can all agree that the guards who allowed Epstein the privilege to end his life did a grave injustice to the young girls whose lives have been destroyed by this heartless predator. But was it really the guards who mistakenly allowed this? Or was Epstein's death orchestrated? That was the question on everyone's mind for the longest time. And the response of the prison guards to these allegations finally revealed the truth. Tova Noel and Michael Thomas, the two prison guards responsible for guarding the cell where Epstein committed suicide, admitted to falling to monitor him for over three hours. Earlier, they admitted panicking and falsifying the jail records in a bid to cover up their mistake, a mistake the law enforcement agencies were quick to identify, imposing relevant charges for falsification of official records. Epstein was kept in a special housing unit after strong suspicions of suicidal behavior. The guards were instructed to check on Epstein every 30 minutes and record entries in the official log for the supervisors to monitor. But they failed to do their duty diligently and when Epstein killed himself, they hurriedly added false entries to the log to show that they had been checking on Epstein as required. The police investigation revealed that in reality, the two guards spent three hours browsing the internet and sleeping. The disclosure came on May 2021, as the two staff members were suspended on administrative leave and the US Department of Justice began its investigation into the Epstein suicide case. The litany of failures which allowed such a high-profile prisoner to die in a high-security cell. In order to enter a plea deal with the prosecutor and the Department of Justice, Michael Thomas and Tova Noel decided to come clean about their mistake. They managed to secure a deferred prosecution agreement which required no jail time. Instead, the two guards were given a supervised release where they were required to serve 100 hours of community service and ensure complete cooperation with the Justice Department's investigation of Epstein's suicide. A Republican Senator, Ben Sass, echoed the victims and the public's reaction to this disgraceful plea deal, calling it unacceptable and demanding a detailed report into the failures of the prison agency. The victims who accused Epstein of heinous acts of sexual abuse and pedophilic behavior deserved a day in court, and they felt cheated when he was allowed to take his life in prison. Compared to their suffering, serving 100 hours in prison seems like a sick joke. Even those arrested for traffic violations face more serious charges than this. 
it is important to realize that the man who escaped justice was not a common criminal or a street thug. He was the ringleader of an international child sex trafficking ring responsible for ruining hundreds of lives, considering the victims who did not come forward. Epstein's death brought the entire investigation to a halt. The trial would have opened a Pandora's box of dirty secrets, given the fact that Epstein's co-conspirators were some of the world's most high-profile individuals, including princes, presidents, and prominent socialites. Epstein took all their dirty secrets to his grave, giving everyone involved in the global child sex trafficking ring a free pass. So that poses the question, why were these guards given so much leniency? Is it just the prison system failing us once again, or are other, more sinister forces at work here? Perhaps one day, we will get an answer to those questions. But as of now, these negligent guards will only have to clean a few streets before returning back to work. Now, I know America's prison system is extremely subpar, but this is on another level. Epstein was a high-profile criminal, and his death under prison suicide watch is a controversy that has caused significant humiliation for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. It has highlighted the weaknesses and incapacity of the prison system. Epstein had just been removed from suicide watch but was left for eight hours before he was found with a noose around his neck. Those guards have pleaded not guilty, their union blaming staff shortages. Prosecutors maintained that Michael Thomas and Trover Noel were sitting on desks that were a mere four meters away from the cell where Epstein was kept. Instead of doing their jobs, they spent time browsing online websites for motorcycles and furniture. They couldn't bother to walk down to the cell as required every 30 minutes, but enjoyed leisurely strolls around the unit and the common area. Epstein's suicide garnered the Federal Bureau of Prisons International a lot of lashback. Most importantly, it shed light on gross lapses in security and major staffing issues across the prison system. The investigation revealed that both guards responsible for monitoring Epstein were serving overtime shifts, given the heightened staffing shortages in the prison. One of the guards did not primarily serve as a correctional officer. He was serving an overtime shift for five consecutive days. The other guard was completing his second eight-hour shift that day as part of his mandatory overtime requirements. If you think this was a one-off incident for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, you would be dead wrong. As it happens, the agency has been overwhelmed by innumerable allegations of severe misconduct over the years. But Epstein's suicide became the most colossal badge of failure in its belt. In 2019, the US Congress released a report containing its findings on the shortcomings of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The report showed federal prison compounds nationwide struggle with routine lockdowns due to the escalation of violence among criminals. It is common for guards to falsify reports and records regularly, and instances of misconduct are blatantly ignored. More alarming is the fact that staffing shortages are putting prisoners and guards in grave danger. Why is all that important? Well, it sets a precedent that Epstein's guards followed. They were overworked, but they also knew they did not have to do their jobs well. They could falsify the records and still walk away scot-free. And that is exactly what happened, judging based on these absurdly light punishments they got for letting one of the worst criminals in American history commit suicide. They followed their peers, and it has led to what I can only call the most abhorrent failure of the prison system in recent history. But that is not all the Epstein guard case revealed. The congressional staff failed to ensure Epstein was assigned a cellmate and failed to take other required measures to ensure he was safe. Did you know that Jeffrey Epstein was placed under close psychological observation after committing his first suicide attempt just a few days before his death? That's right. They knew the man was trying to end it, and they just straight up ignored it. The first failed suicide attempt caused severe bruising and scraping around his neck. Following that, Epstein was placed on a 31-hour suicide watch. Here comes the curious part, though. All the while, Epstein vehemently denied being suicidal. 
In fact, Epstein told a prison psychologist about his wonderful life and how he would be completely crazy to want to end it. Then, why did he end it? Epstein's suicide left a long trail of unanswered questions that the investigators failed to unravel, even after years of probing and prying. Under the Freedom of Information Act, the Federal Bureau of Prisons released over 4,000 pages of observational notes and official documents pertaining to the investigation into Epstein's suicide. These documents offer a more nuanced understanding of the events before Epstein took his life. And let me tell you, what they revealed is shocking, to say the least. Here is what we found from these documents. On the 6th of July, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was brought to the Metropolitan Correctional Center. For the first 22 hours, Epstein spent his time languishing with the regular prisoners and criminals of the Metropolitan Jail. But soon after, he was placed in a special unit in light of his superior notoriety and massive coverage from national and international media. According to the documents, Epstein was increasingly bothered about the mandatory dress code. The dress code included an orange jumpsuit, mandatory for all prisoners housed in the special unit. Imagine committing such vile acts and your biggest grip being the color of your uniform. He complained constantly and incessantly and blamed the jail authorities for treating him like the bad guy, even though his behavior was exceptionally good. During his visits with his lawyers every other day, Epstein made several requests to be allowed to wear a brown uniform. According to his initial health screening, the 66-year-old offender had sexual relations with over 10 partners during the last five years. The records revealed that he struggled with multiple afflictions, including constipation, lower back aches, sleep apnea, and hypertension, and was also pre-diabetic. The medical records also highlighted that he had been treated for chlamydia earlier. According to the records compiled by the prison authorities, Epstein was adjusting to his prison lifestyle and surroundings. He subscribed for the kosher meal plan and instructed his lawyer to request permission for outdoor workouts. Just two days before he killed himself, Epstein splurged over $73 at the prison commissary buying multiple items, including headphones and an AM-FM radio. Now call me mad, but why would a person who wanted to end it all act like this? What led him to transition from this behavior to a drive to off himself? Turns out, these documents answer those questions too. Prison cameras reveal the accused sex trafficker went unchecked from approximately 10.30 p.m. August 9th until 6.30 a.m. the next day. On the 18th of July, 2019, Epstein's spirit sank when a judge rejected his bail plea. It was decided that Epstein must remain jailed until his trial. Things had not gone according to Epstein's plan. He had probably thought of ways to escape the country to avoid justice. But now, the only thing he was confident about was that the trial would lead to his conviction and long-term sentence. Epstein was facing over 40 years of imprisonment. Four days after this judgment, Epstein was found lying on the floor with a piece of bedsheet wrapped around his neck. But this time, he survived. The injuries were minor. so. It was decided that a hospital visit wasn't on the cards. Instead, he was put on suicide watch and psychiatric observation, with multiple guards taking turns to monitor him every 30 minutes. In their observational journal, the prison officers monitoring Epstein wrote that he was usually found seated at the edge of the bed, lost in his thoughts. Some days, he would lean his head against the wall and remain there, lifelessly. During this time, Epstein began complaining of the noises that disturbed his sleep in the prison cell, fueling his insomnia and mental health challenges. The noise that bothered him so much came from the toilet in his prison cell. It was malfunctioning. The documents include an email from the chief psychologist in the prison requesting the authorities to shift him to the adjacent cell until the toilet is functional again. The psychologist highlighted that Epstein was forced to remain in a cell with a broken toilet. 
As much as I would love to see that debauched sexual abuser suffer, perhaps the authorities should have listened. If Epstein really did kill himself, perhaps being able to sleep soundly would have kept him from committing suicide. At least that way, he and his accomplices would have faced the justice they deserved. Though I doubt a man who has done so much evil could ever sleep soundly. Now, back to the report. It mentions that a day before Epstein committed suicide, another meaningful development occurred. A federal judge had opened around 2,000 pages of evidence in a sexual abuse lawsuit filed against Epstein. The prison authorities noted that this new evidence contributed to Epstein's suicidal thoughts and depressive state, slashing all his hopes for acquittal. In a way, this left him with no way out, except one. The officials further revealed that Epstein was completely cut off from all his illustrious social contacts, denying him any chance of building meaningful interpersonal interactions. That, coupled with the prospect of spending his entire remaining life in prison, was making him suicidal. After being removed from Suicide Watch, Epstein was placed under psychological observation, a protocol under which inmates are monitored in their cells every 15 minutes and jail officials chronicle their actions and make detailed observational notes. Based on these notes, we know that most of Epstein's nights were spent walking up and down in his cell. He slept less and enjoyed his time talking with fellow cellmates. Most of the entries made by the observers were commonplace, like notes about him drinking water from the sink or talking to an inmate. But then, some entries were more reflective and deep, for instance, observations of him seated on the edge of the bed with his head fallen into his palms. There is one more important thing that the records show. Apparently, Epstein was constantly deceiving the psychologists, painting a picture of elation and hope, all the while struggling with depression and planning suicide. Most of his days were spent in the conference room huddling with his lawyers. After all, it was one of the rare opportunities to avoid his cell. While conversing with his fellow inmates and psychologists, he weaved glossy tales of partying with celebrities and socialites. When he wasn't regaling them with animated tales of his glamorous escapades, he would show off his knowledge of mathematics and physics and offer investment tips and advice. Then, the incessant complaining would take over, and Epstein would complain about everything from the orange prison clothes and his insomnia because of the running toilet to his numb right arm and dehydration. Trapped in the 12-story Manhattan Detention Center, he had no choice but to befriend some of his fellow inmates and force them into discussions. One inmate later pointed out that Epstein wanted to know who the best chef on 11 North was. The documents containing the observational notes reveal an interesting pattern. Epstein always chose subjects of conversations that made him appear approachable and easy to talk to, all the while giving the impression of how successful, rich, and well-connected he was with the powerful people of the world. For instance, one psychological observation that began at 8 o'clock in the evening began with a discussion about the escort business. An hour later, the entry revealed that Epstein had shifted the discussion to arbitrage. Thirty minutes later, another entry noted that the discussion was now focused on his celebrity buddies and tales of debauchery. A few days later, another psychologist noted that throughout the session, Epstein insisted on discussing mundane topics like taking cabs in New York City. Epstein skillfully manipulated his counselors into animated and lengthy discussions on all topics except his own life. He constantly tried to avoid the events that led to him being jailed. That makes me wonder, was he trying to delude the psychiatrists, or was he deluding himself? Epstein was well known and influential. Movie directors, actors, politicians, princes, and even presidents. And have huge orgies there, and nobody would have any idea what was going on. In his mind, Epstein was the good guy, and he was determined to stick to this image of goodness. It was like an act of defiance, against the overwhelming evidence substantiating the allegations of sexual misconduct and child sex trafficking. The inmates observed 
that Epstein was extremely inquisitive about his surroundings and wanted to learn everything he could about the prison system. When he first arrived in jail, he had a lengthy discussion with the inmates, asking them to share all the crazy things they had witnessed in prison. Later that night, Epstein refused his dinner, saying that it was nasty. Epstein would often talk to the inmates late into the night, completely engrossed in their tales about prison life, jail rules, and whatever crazy story they had. One entry noted that the discussion went on till 2.35 a.m. when the inmate said, class is over, and Epstein was fast asleep in 10 minutes. The impression that Epstein was giving his fellow inmates and psychologists was that of a man who loved being alive and was all about fun and positivity. On the 9th of July, 2019, Epstein went for his formal, impersonal suicide risk assessment. The psychologist observed that Epstein was perfectly coherent, cooperative, polite, and organized. He even had a sense of humor. So how come such a happy-go-lucky prisoner decided to kill himself days later? Well, no one is sure. The same psychologist observed that Epstein vehemently rejected any notions, plans, intentions, or thoughts of suicide. He made certain requests, such as the opportunity to take a shower and brush his teeth, meet with his lawyer, and make one phone call. When describing himself to the psychologist, he said he was a banker with a big business and truly felt that being alive is fun. He aggressively denied all allegations of sexual abuse and maintained that he had never sexually abused anyone. He further added that he would be released on his next bail hearing and everything would return to normal. The psychologist, swayed by Epstein's manipulation and illusionist portrayal of his mental state, noted that he was future-oriented. She concluded that there was no further need for suicide watch but just to be careful, Epstein should continue the psychological observations. This proved to be a gross miscalculation that cost dozens of victims their only hope for justice after years of systematic sexual and emotional abuse. The Federal Bureau of Prisons report also notes that just weeks before his suicide, Epstein made some very weird statements. He said that he was a coward. He also said he was facing extreme difficulty adapting to his drastically changed circumstances. Not only that, but he could not believe that everyone he once called friend was now seeking distance from his filth-riddled life. I mean, I can believe it just fine. If these signs were not enough, the next thing he asked for should have rung all the alarm bells for the prison guards and the psychologists on Epstein's case. After spending days with other prisoners and holding animated discussions with them late into the night, Epstein suddenly asked to be placed in a single cell. Why did Epstein seek to be housed alone? Even a fool can tell he wanted to commit suicide. So naturally, this request was denied due to concerns for his safety and security. When this request was made, a psychologist observed that Epstein was smirking the whole time while answering questions about suicide ideation. Callously and joyfully, he dismissed the idea and said, why would you ever think I would be suicidal? He maintained that someone like him could never feel suicidal unless it was the only way left to escape justice. And that is exactly what happened on 18th July 2019 when his renewed request for bail was denied by Judge Richard M. Berman. It became crystal clear that Epstein would never return to his glamorous life jet-setting with Wall Street tycoons and partying with Hollywood celebrities and American politicians. His friends had abandoned him out of sheer shame of having known and being photographed with this filthy predator. The same pictures they were struggling to cover up with a flimsy denial of being acquainted with him or brushing shoulders at some random party. Five days after his renewed request for bail was denied by Judge Richard M. Berman, Epstein committed suicide in the early dawn hours of 23rd July 2019. He was in a jail cell in Manhattan that he apparently took his own life. This can only be the tip of the iceberg. The post-mortem psychological reconstruction report noted that considering the psychological impact of the judge's decision to deny bail, the prison psychologist should have reassessed Epstein to examine his mental state before sending him to the single cell. 
removing Epstein from suicide watch after a mere 31 hours was a colossal mistake. He was clearly misleading the psychologists, manipulating them into believing that psychological observation was enough to keep him alive. Multiple officials from the prison's psychological services revealed that Epstein was vehemently in denial of ever harboring any suicidal thoughts. He would charm them with his sense of humor, cracking wild jokes. He would always smile and appear courteous, the demeanor of a man who was happy and content and assured of his future. Epstein even quipped that since he was Jewish, committing suicide would be against the teachings of his religion. All the while, he showed that his greatest woe was a broken toilet and an orange jumpsuit. Perhaps it was a way he showed how carefree his life was. One psychologist observed that Epstein spent hours sitting in the corner, using his hands to cover his ears. Once, Epstein noted that he might be showing symptoms of autism. He gave the example of Rain Man, referring to the autistic character played by Dustin Hoffman, noting how he too suffered severe agitation when exposed to noise. The newly obtained records offer no support to the explosion of conspiracy theories that Epstein's death was not a suicide. They also shed no light on questions raised by his brother and one of his lawyers that he might have been assisted in killing himself. But they do paint a picture of incompetence and sloppiness by the Bureau of Prisons. The night Epstein committed suicide, he lied to all prison officials and requested a phone call to speak to his mother. The truth is, Epstein's mother had died a long time ago. Instead, Epstein had called his girlfriend. This one thing perhaps shows that he really did want to kill himself that night, seeing as he tried to contact the one person who was still sticking by him. Then again, a lot of people benefited from his untimely death. People who had a lot to hide, so nothing can be said for sure. But if Epstein did kill himself, we must ask, did one of America's highest funded agencies allow a sexual predator to go scot-free? More importantly, who is to be blamed for all those other accomplices getting away? Someone needs to take responsibility for this fiasco, and I doubt some community service is going to fix the mess these guards have made. Well folks, that is it for this video. Don't forget to share your thoughts with me in the comments. Also, be sure to like and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Until next time.